President Proctor, go ahead. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the San Mateo Foster City School District Board of Trustees meeting. It is February 24th, 2022, and I'm calling the meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. We are going to recess to closed session where we, we will discuss items 2.1, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, government code section 54956.9a, claim number 2019-01789, and 2.2, government code section 54957, public employee discipline dismissal release. We will reconvene to the regular meeting at about 6.30. Thank you. President Proctor, go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are recommitting to the regular meeting with nothing to report out from our closed session. Uh, we will go to 3.2, which is our flag salute. Please stand and join me. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. And, to and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands one, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Okay, we will go on to item 3.3, roll call. Um, Trustee Warren? Yes. Trustee Watkins? Here. Trustee Corzo? Present. Trustee Chen? Here. And I am also here. Item 3.4 is approval of agenda for February 24th, 2022. Motion to approve tonight's agenda. Second. Thank you, Trustee Watkins for the motion and Trustee Corzo for the second. Uh, we'll go to roll call, Trustee Warren. Yes. Trustee Watkins. Yes. Trustee Corzo. Yes. Trustee Chen. Yes. And I also vote yes. Item 3.5 is approval of the minutes for February 1st and our special board meeting on February 10th. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you, Trustee Corzo for the motion and Trustee Chin for the second. Um, Trustee Warren. Yes. Trustee Watkins. Yes. Trustee Corzo? Yes. Trustee Chen? Yes. And I will also vote yes. Um, Trustee Corzo, would you mind doing the Spanish translation announcement, please? Bienvenidos, gracias por estar aquí. Por favor, si ocupa traducción, levante la mano. También puede, um, puede hacer clic en el mundo que ve en su pantalla para, um, para aprender la interpretación de esa manera. Gracias. Thank you. Um, we will now go to item 4.1, public statements related to non-agenda topics. The San Mateo Foster City School Board cannot act upon any matter that has not been included and publicly posted on the agenda, except under limited circumstances as permitted by law. The board may refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. Please limit your statements to three minutes. Peter, would you mind checking to see if anyone has any public comments? Absolutely. For those uh, that have comment or maybe for the first time joining us via this uh, Zoom, if you'd like to make public comment on anything that is not on the agenda for this evening, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom and I'll call on you one at a time to give you your three minutes to the board. President Proctor, we have no hands for public comment on non-agendized items. Thank you. Um, item 4.2 is public statements related to agenda items. Persons will be called on at the appropriate time. So we will move on to item 4.3, which is foundation committee reports. Does anyone have any reports to share? I can start off. Um, the if I find my notes here real quick. Um, Ed Foundation uh, meeting was 
earlier this week, last week, uh, recently. <laughs> and um, there was a lot of discussion on the readathon. So really incredible work um, that I just wanted to highlight some things from the readathon. So the total minutes read by students this year was 862,233, which was about three times as many minutes as, was, as were read last year, which is really incredible. Um, and the total dollars raised was 126,145. In addition to that, Virus Geeks, their CEO donated an additional $25,000 kind of to the effort. So that brought the total raised during the fundraiser to 152, a little over $152,000. Um, I did wanna share just a couple of highlights from school. So there was just a lot of growth but I think um, just wanted to shout out a couple of schools. So every school increased their logged minutes significantly. Lead, Sunny Bray, and Highlands had the largest growth in reading minutes, which is really incredible. And Beach Park had the highest average minutes per student. And then in terms of fundraising, Parkside, Foster City, and Highlands had the largest growth in overall donations um, with Bayside, Beach Park, and Meadow Heights also showing tremendous growth. So just wanted to highlight um, some of those schools that like, we were um, had the opportunity to be at LEAD actually this week um, and kind of just see um, the excitement from the librarian there around supporting that effort. And so it really, really showed, um, wanted to highlight that. And um, so this will be supporting the TK5 music program, science curriculum, EL and ELD material and a lot more. And they're having an awards ceremony this Sunday at Foster City where a local author, Christy Hale, is gonna do a reading and each of the top readers and fundraisers are gonna receive a signed copy of her book along with a certificate of thanks. So really exciting um, updates. There were some also some discussions around additional grant opportunities that the foundation is considering, um, some preliminary, preliminary, preliminary discussion around outdoor um, ed kind of strategy. How do we ensure that all kids that wanna go are able to go and kind of what that looks like in collaboration with the district um, and, and some other topics, but really the focus on readathon. So huge shout out to everyone that made that happen. Um, so that's the Ed Foundation. And then the Equity Task Force had a meeting. Uh, yeah, Ed Foundation must have been last week because the Ed Equity Task Force meeting was this week um, where the Equity Task Force, similar to what they were, um, what happened at the last, at last month's meeting, um, actually dug into two very specific discipline policies um, with some proposed changes that the district team had kind of worked on in terms of um, kind of an exemplar model for what those policies might look like to better align with the board and district vision to have you know, more culturally responsive, more restorative approach to discipline um, that doesn't utilize uh, law enforcement as kind of the first go-to strategy. And so the Equity Task Force had an opportunity to talk about those policies, give some feedback and input. They still have an open window for folks that weren't able to be there to dig into them. And then we'll be bringing that back to the district team. I think the Equity Task Force might look at them one more time um, but those policies will start to roll up to the board so um, uh, for our discussion and approval as well. So um, I believe next month, is that right, Superintendent Ochoa, um, we'll, be, we'll be looking at the two that the Equity Task Force had an opportunity to dig into. So I'm really, really excited for us to look at those um, and to continue that work of uh, both the, uh, of that school to prison pipeline resolution that we passed almost two years ago now. Thank you, Trustee Watkins. Are there any other um, foundation or committee reports? Yes, I will give a quick update. I attended two um, committees or two meetings uh, in the past two weeks, one uh, for the DEI task force, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force with the City of San Mateo. Um, we spent a lot of time just, again, revisiting the purpose of the group and hearing from folks about what their motivations were for wanting to do that work um, in that space. And so we will continue to do that. It was a really good meeting. And I also attended the sanctuary, actually, Ken and I attended the sanctuary task force meeting um, today and um, also another really good meeting. Um, 
help me out here because I know I talked a lot during the meeting, but I need your help, Ken. I mean, Trustee Chin, sorry. <laughs> uh, it was a good meeting. We talked about uh, the family that was affected um, by the fire in Sunnybury and all the outpouring and um, assistance that the district and uh, the community is providing. We also talked about housing insecurities. Uh, and then also um, we talked about the um, over identification of our Latinx students into special ed and the processes and um, programs that are going to be uh, talked about and hopefully changed over the um, next few months. Yeah. And in addition, we also discussed, um, actually, some, one of the task force members shared that there will be, like you mentioned, we talked about like housing issues, but also that there will be an event. And that event is tentatively scheduled for uh, mid-March. And so once we have that date solidified, we'll share that with everyone. But it will be a, an event in Spanish um, in partnership with Hip Housing and Project Sentinel to discuss um, tenant uh, protections specifically um, for even, I believe, um, our undocumented community and um, just re like how home sharing resources and, and information from hip housing. So um, the other thing was childcare that was flagged as a, an, a concern that's been bubbling up a lot from parents. And so um, we will, oh, oh, so I, sh we shared, I shared information just about like, you know, how we had a discussion and a presentation in our board meeting, um, I wanna say a month ago or mm -hmm. fairly recently and how um, that is something that we are, um, you know, going to be spending more time on in terms of uh, just making sure we're meeting the needs of uh, all of our students and, um, and and all of our families. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other reports this time? Okay. We will move on to item 4.4, SMEDA CSEA SMEA updates. Peter, are you able to add anybody? My apologies, I am bringing them all in. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't have much to update. I did just want to take a second to acknowledge an item further down on the agenda, the um, classified layoff resolution. Um, we are meeting with HR tomorrow and the magical Susan Ronzani wizard has not worked her magic yet. Um, last year, I don't even think we laid anybody off at the end. I might be wrong. Maybe there was a couple hours, but I know it looks bad for classified employees if you're on here, but I, I promise you the HR department is going to do their best to retain everybody's jobs. Um, other than that, I hope you all had a fabulous three-day weekend and hopefully we'll have more for you next time. Hi, I'll go next. Um, I'm not Julie MacArthur. Um, good evening, everyone, uh, board members, Superintendent Ochoa, and our public. I'm Catherine Pratt, and I am Sweden's vice president. Julie MacArthur, our president, she's doing, uh, she's participating in some CTA business right now, this afternoon, and uh, continue on to now. So I will uh, give our brief SMEDA update uh, report. So first thing to report is our bargaining team had its first uh, session with the district last week on our su successor agreement. And we look forward to continuing that conversation next week. 
this is definitely a busy time of year for our members and everything. We're rounding up our second trimester, and many of us, many of the sites are celebrating uh, Read Across America Week next week, uh, Read Across America Day, a lot of literacy weeks happening as well. And the final thing to talk about is um, I noticed that on tonight's agenda, you'll be going through the mid-year LCAP updates. Um, I know that SMENA members uh, in the past have really appreciated the practice that's happened in the past couple of years of asking for feedback and um, allowing for us to give some genuine input into the upcoming plans. And so we are definitely open to working with others to help find ways where we can continue that process um, this coming year so that when the, the upcoming LCAP plan is is put together that um, we have some input as well. And um, that's all I have for updates for us. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Nima Tahai. I'm the principal of Parkside Montessori. I'm here representing to do the SMEA report. Um, hello, board, Superintendent Ochoa. It's, it's an honor to be here tonight. Um, I've been asked to share a little bit about my, my school site. I'm proud to represent Parkside Montessori um, and have two uh, fun updates that I'd love to share. Um, one is last week, Parkside was visited by the National Center for Montessori and the public sector. They're a nonprofit organization that works with Montessori schools and especially Montessori schools that are working in school districts as opposed to private schools. So they wear that extra lens. Um, they visited our school for three days. They visited every classroom. They held focus groups with all of our teachers, uh, four focus groups with parents, even with our fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students. It was just a wonderful visit. They left us with a debrief with some really inspiring feedback, and we'll be sharing a detailed report with us related to the visit um, in a couple of weeks. So excited to, to use that feedback to help us continuously improve our practices at Parkside um, in conjunction with the new strategic plan that's been approved. So excited about Parkside continuing to build on our Montessori practices and aligning with our district's direction. Um, the second exciting update that I have for the Parkside community is a few years ago, I stood before this board and a decision was made that Parkside Montessori would be expanding to middle school. Um, we currently have sixth graders on campus, and I'm an elementary guy, so sixth graders, that, that's, that's not my wheelhouse, but they are lovely, and I'm enjoying it, uh, and they're enjoying it, and the families are enjoying it, which has been awesome, and I'm excited to announce that next year we will have our first cohort of seventh graders, um, and we will continue that expansion to become a full-on TK8 program, so just really grateful to this board for your trust and belief in our community and in Montessori and to Superintendent Ochoa and the Executive Cabinet for all your support. Uh, we wanna make you proud. We wanna make sure that we are diversifying our program and really fulfilling our vision of Montessori for all. We're a public school and we wanna make sure that we are serving all students in our district. And so it's grateful to be here tonight, share those two quick updates um, and thank you so much for your time and support. Thank you very much, Alicia, Catherine and Nima for those updates. Um, we will now go on to item 4.5. My apologies, please hold. Are we all still here? Yes, my apologies, okay. President Proctor, as I was trying to relieve our visitors, I accidentally clicked on you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I thought I, I did it because I had a lot of windows open. Um, so anyways, 4.5, we'll go to announcements. Um, does anyone have any announcements to share? I want to share something really quickly, but I'm looking for a date. Wait. Sorry. 
different. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know what happened. I was like not a panelist anymore and then promoted again. So I'm, I think I'm good now. Um, uh, okay. Yes. So I just wanted to share that this past Saturday, I attended a day of remembrance event at the city of San Mateo public library. Um, it was a day of remembrance for the um, essentially detention that the that our Japanese um, community members uh, experienced um, many years ago. And uh, it was a presentation that was actually given by um, former city council member Steve Okamoto. And it was a really uh, just a very somber but like really important and it was just I, I felt really grateful to to be there and to learn about that history so I wanted to highlight that for us all to just take um, a pause and think about and um, yeah that's my announcement thank you if, it, if I may just follow up on that uh, President Proctor um, the uh, there is also a memoriam um, that is going up at the Tanfran BART station to um, honor those who uh, were uh, in the internment camps uh, during that time. So uh, personally, uh, my father-in-law was actually born in uh, at Tanfran back at the um, at the horse stables uh, on the way to the internment camps. So my family, my my wife's family, actually has a, a long history there in terms of. Um, this issue, but if for those who want, there is um, they are still raising money uh, for the memorial. Uh, and um, if you want, I'm sure you can Google it. I don't have the address at the moment, so thank you. Oh, I'll just continue on um, on next Thursday, March third. Uh, for those who are interested, the City of San Mateo is having a general plan subcommittee uh, meeting. Uh, this is uh, talking about the general plan and the future de development of the City of San Mateo. Uh, schools and the school population was talked about it um, at the previous uh, meeting, uh, and it may be talked about again uh, in the future development. Um, but for those who are interested, uh, I believe the meeting's at six o'clock, and, and it's online. So jumping back to the um, memorial at Ten Fran. If uh, you want more information or you want to donate, you can go to tanfriendmemorial.org. And there's also an email in case you know someone who um, was there and they're going to have as part of the memorial a um, uh, names inscripted into a, a huge wall, I believe. And so if you have names or you know anyone in the community who um, whose name should be there, you can email that to tanfran.memorial at gmail.com. And um, yeah, please spread the word about that. And I personally know that like the woman who I call grandma, who um, was a dear friend to my mom and the owner of the house that we rented for almost 25 years, um, she, she was there as well. So we're gonna make sure that her name is there. So yeah, thank you. Okay, I was going to just share. Um, I had a meeting with a couple of parents from um, Sunnybrae, and they shared with me um, an event that's going to be on March 20th. So I wanted to share it with everybody. Um, it's in conjunction with the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition and movesemateo.org. There's going to be a bike ride. It's on March 20th. It's a women's bike ride, but everyone is welcome. And if you're interested, the meetup is at Beresford Park in San Mateo. And you're gonna loop around to Central Park and have some refreshments. And um, they're suggesting people wear pink. So that's at 10 a.m. on March 20th. And also I was just gonna mention to everybody that we did attend some school site visits this week. We went to Lead and George Hall. So I just wanted to thank um, the students and principals and everybody that works at those schools for being so welcoming and letting us come in your classrooms and 
watch recess and um, it was just a really, it was a really great time to be on campus. So thank you to everyone. Are there any more announcements before we move on? Okay, we'll go to 4.6 superintendent report, Superintendent Ochoa. Thank you, President Proctor. Um, my comments will focus on a couple of items. The first is a thank you to the uh, College Park staff and parents and our absolutely wonderful College Park students who participated in the Lunar New Year Parade in San Francisco. Um, I had never been to the event and I was just very blown away by the beauty and the um, pride and the um, just the whole welcoming nature of the event. Um, it was uh, really something to see our our uh, students um, who we we walked about two miles um, and that's not a short walk for you know for that time of, of day and the entire time we walked our students were actually playing music that um, our kindergarten teacher there um, who actually used to be a high school band director uh, fortunately for us he writes a new piece of music for them every year and they have to learn a new routine every year um, and the students were just flawless. So they're walking and playing at the same time. And that's not easy to do. And um, their outfits were just beautiful. And they're, they were so kind to everybody who was there. And it was just a wonderful experience. And I want to thank those folks for doing that. Um, thank our, our principal, Dr. Singh. Um, in addition, I want to thank our two schools that hosted us for our school visitation. It was really great to get in and see classroom instruction. Um, it was really awesome to come into contact with uh, the students and staff who are there every day putting in the hard work. Um, it's particularly uh, great to be able to see how these schools function as teams that support each other. I do want to point out um, the staff at George Hall did do a beautiful job of setting up the uh, lounge in a very kind and generous way and set us up with some food, which was really great. But also we had an experience at LEAD in their uh, library. Uh, so for all those folks out there, if you haven't been to the LEAD library, it is really adorable to go in there and see the way the librarian has set up all the books and all the uh, tables. And it's just very, it's just very beautiful. Um, the people in our district have a lot of pride in what they do, and I just wanted to call them out for, for doing that really great work. And then I wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about the districts, um, you know, moving forward our uh, engagement with parents over the next couple of weeks. Um, we held two Cafe Con Diego events and a YouTube live stream to talk about the new guidance regarding outdoor masking, uh, the district did send out a message to all parents informing them that uh, students and staff could actually unmask outdoors. Um, that has been a couple of weeks out. Uh, in my visits to schools, I actually still tend to see most students still wearing their mask outdoors. And I think that's just a personal choice right now for many of our students. But the big takeaway is I wanted to let families know that we sent out a survey. So check your email if you haven't done it, but we've received close to 1500 responses uh, from the survey, which is really great. We also sent the survey out to staff and have received close to 700 responses from staff. So staff, thank you for doing that. Um, and we're starting to tabulate what those results are. We believe we're gonna send out a summary of those results uh, next Monday for everybody to be able to view. And we have some important events coming up. We've got a, a, a board community workshop at Sunny Break coming up, a few others on the calendar that are gonna be going out very soon here. Uh, invitations via uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram as well tomorrow. The whole purpose of those events is to draw families in, to talk about things going on in our district, and to give families a voice in their work with our school board members to be able to talk directly to school board members. Um, and I really look forward to those events and hope to see you all there. Thank you very much for that update. We will now go on to item five, the proposed consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion in the form listed below. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion, unless members of the board, staff, or public request specific items to be removed and discussed from the consent agenda. 
The superintendent and staff recommend approval of all consent items. Movement of any recommended consent item is appropriate at this time. Are there any trustees that would like to um, move any items off the consent agenda? Okay, Peter, can you check with our Zoom room? Absolutely. If there are any members of the public that would like to pull an agenda item to make public comment, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. I'll call upon you and ask you what specific item you would like to make comment on. Okay, President Proctor, we have no hands for the proposed consent agenda. Okay, then we will bring it back to the board for our motion. A motion to approve the consent agenda. I will second. Thank you, Trustee Corzo for the motion and Trustee Watkins for the second. We will do roll call, so Trustee Warren. Yes. Trustee Watkins. Yes. Trustee Corzo. Yes. Trustee Chicken. Yes. And I also vote yes. Moving on. Let me scroll down. Okay. Um, the next item is item number six, public hearing adoption of the, wait, is that right? Okay, adoption of revised elections by trustee area map and resolution. Superintendent Ochoa. Thank you, President Proctor. If we could just note the time is 7.06. Um, tonight uh, is our second public hearing pertaining to the adoption of revised elections by trustee area maps and resolutions in light of education code 5019.5, which is consistent with the requirement, uh, the board reviewing draft scenarios and adjusting those uh, decisions uh, to attempt to reach population balance. Um, so at, at the board's invitation, I will wait uh, President Proctor for you to gavel in the public hearing. And then I, I would like to speak on behalf of the presentation uh, before um, others of the members of the public speak on the item. Okay, the public hearing is now open at 7.07 p.m. And I would request to enter the public hearing first and uh, make this presentation. As the board recalls, we did have legal counsel present at our last meeting to make this presentation. Um, a comparison of the two reports will show that they're very, very close. Um, so um, I did not, uh, uh, was not able to have legal counsel return this evening. Um, as you know, these meetings are taking place all over the state of California and they are um, presenting to other school boards tonight um, who are taking similar action. But what this report indicates and the presentation that was given to the board at our last meeting, which is the same, uh, ultimately, content from the last meeting with some additional maps uh, included is that part of the process uh, for uh, electing by trustee area requires that every 10 years the school district review new census data to determine the extent to which um, the trustee areas fall under under a variance of less than 10 percent uh, the district's originally adopted map after the decennial review of 2020 arrived at a 9.75 total population variance, which is under the 10%, and at the same time, a very high percentage in and of itself. Uh, the presentation indicates and shows that uh, over time, uh, the total population and the age 18 over population do have some differences. So whereas one group might have a slightly lower total population, they might have a slightly higher over 18 population. And those are considerations that are reviewed when doing this kind of decennial uh, um, the, the citizen voting age population is also very key uh, uh, consideration in this case uh, over uh, the span of 2015 to 2019. Uh, that information is included in this report as well. Um, and then the location of where those uh, pockets of high percentage uh, voting age population is also included in this presentation for uh, the board's consideration. Um, the current trustee areas are included in this map. That is page five 
of this presentation. Um, in addition to that, an analysis of the current trustees areas is included in this presentation, uh, leading us to what considerations uh, are taken in terms of voting areas. Uh, the first is that these areas contain a pretty close to equal number of inhabitants, uh, that they're drawn to comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act, that they be compact and contiguous uh, to the extent possible that when possible, they may follow man-made and natural geographic features such as uh, pathways and, and waterways, and to the extent possible, respect incumbency if possible, including other uh, considerations and a very key consideration in that respect uh, being communities of interest, in which case um, that's something we definitely as a district and as a board um, have discussed. So at our last presentation, the board was uh, given scenario one, map scenario one, which is page nine of this presentation. The board was presented with map scenario two, which is on page 10 of this presentation. The board was presented with map scenario three, uh, which was uh, included in this uh, presentation as well. And following the, uh, the meeting, the board uh, during during the deliberation of the item, determined that uh, more time was needed and that uh, we would request from our demographer additional conceptual trustee areas. And from that feedback directly from members of the board, we were able to um, consult with our demographer and uh, produce for the board and for the public a review of map scenario 2A. Map scenario 2A is in fact one of the new maps that is included uh, for the board tonight in the deliberation. Uh, the data for map 2A is included in there. Uh, and the other additional map uh, in addition to map 1A, in addition to map 2A, is during our last presentation to the board, we did not include the originally adopted 2021 map, and we have done so tonight. So as, as it pertains to the board's deliberation uh, following this public hearing, the board would is being presented the option of adopting the originally adopted 2021 map, scenario 1, Scenario 1A, Scenario 2, Scenario 2A, and Scenario 3. Um, I will make the comment that Scenario 1A and Scenario 2A were named as such so that uh, members of the board and members of the public could closely review how those two maps relate to each other. So scenario Map Scenario 1 is actually very close to Map Scenario 1A. And for that reason, we labeled it that way because uh, following board input, we were able to make some adjustments to map scenario one. And that ultimately led us to have map scenario 1A. The same is true for map scenario two, which led us to make some changes for map scenario 2A. Um, certainly a lot to take in, um, many maps to consider. Um, at this point in time, President Proctor, this being a public hearing, um, I'll conclude my comments and uh, respectfully request that the board continue this public hearing and, and uh, solicit input from community members. And uh, when those uh, public input have been made and completed, that we close the public hearing. Thank you, Superintendent Ochoa. Um, Peter, would you mind checking to see if there's anyone from the public that would like to make any comments? For this public hearing. Absolutely. If there are any members of the public that would like to participate in this public hearing and make comment to the board, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now and I'll call you in the order of your hand being raised. Okay. President Proctor, we have no hands for any comment. Thank you. Uh, we will close this public hearing at 7.14 p.m. and move right into item 7.1, selection of a by-trustee area map. So at this time, President Proctor, um, administration recommends that the board uh, deliberate um, that a motion be made for the board to adopt one of the maps presented to the board this evening. 
Um, we do have a responsibility to uh, make that decision this evening and to forward that decision um, on to the county. Um, and uh, at this point in time, I'll respectfully uh, request that the board do so. And I'm uh, available for any clarifications or any questions that you might have. Okay, are there any clarifying questions at this time? Okay, Peter, can we go to public comment on this item? Absolutely, if there are any members of the public that would like to make public comment, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. We have no hands for public comment. Okay, then we will bring it back to the board here for any comments that anyone would like to make. And I know I, I said it, I'll just start it off. I, I said my piece last week, which is fine. Um, there are three maps that I could um, be in favor of um, and I'll do them in order. One is our original map uh, 209. The other one is scenario three, and then the next one is scenario 2A. Um, so those, those are the ones that I would be in favor of. My preferred map is um, 1A. Uh, I'll keep, I'm going to hold. Um, just confirm that there, I mean, I'm interested to hear other people's thoughts and then maybe we, um, maybe everyone can kind of share their their preferred ones. And then if there's no overlap, then we can see where we go from there in terms of making a motion. Yeah. I also prefer map 1A. Well, I appreciate being able to see map 209 again. Um, it reminded me why we all just kind of were like, well, it's the best of what we've got at the time. Um, you know, and I think that's why we all ended up being inclined to vote for it because it was the best of what we were given. That said, I feel that we've been given better maps and maps that more truly reflect um, the communities that we are will all ultimately serve. Um, you know, you know, even having that other map, the map 209, you know, represented, um, I'm still, you know, feeling the same way about um, you know, you know, now I guess it's more 1A and 2A. Um, because I think the the slightly revised version took into trustee Corza's um, recommendation of adjusting that boundary um, of between what was it two and three I don't have to pull up the map again um, I'm sorry excuse me four and three um, moving the um, boundary for four just slightly what is it black back a couple blocks from South Delaware it appears and I feel horrible not knowing exactly the names of the streets there. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, as listening to Trusty Corzo talk about as somebody who lives in that neighborhood and knows that neighborhood, um, I feel like her recommendation has a lot of weight. So I'm willing to go with either 1A or 2A. My preference is 1A. Um, I, I see that 
there's a majority for 1A, I'll just make my one comment about it, um, is that um, 1A, uh, when you look at it and you look at the, imagine sort of overlaying the enrollments on it and the complexes that we deal with in terms of Borel and Abbott, uh, you're making uh, trustee area number three, a heavy, uh, heavily populated sort of Borel complex. And sort of, and the other one is sort of heavily sort of Abic complex. Um, the difference between splitting up 1A and 2A is that um, when you move Highlands over into trustee area five, that kind of splits those complexes up a little bit. So th that those two trustees and somewhat's not necessarily being on the island by themselves, they would have to essentially work together because there's more uh, student enrollment overlap. And so that's why I favor uh, two way, um, because one A sort of brings into the fear of what we always or what we originally thought was, you know, how do you divide up the city and not make little trusty islands, in somewhat where they only care about their own schools that are in uh, in their area. So, um, so that's my piece. Um, but if you guys want to motion for one A, then um, and we can vote on it, so. Appreciate the perspective, Trustee Chin. I, I'll, unless anybody else has a comment, I'll go ahead with the motion for, um, to approve um, map scenario 1A. I will second that. Thank you, Trustee Watkins for the motion and Trustee Proctor for the second. Um, let's go to a roll call vote. Trustee Warren. Aye. Trustee Watkins. Yes, sorry. Oh. Trustee Corzo. Yes. Trustee Chen. Uh, I'll vote down. Thank you. And I will vote yes. So that's... Um, four yeses and one no, and the motion passes. Um, okay, moving on to 7.2, resolution number 21, 22 to 22, <laughs> resolution of the Board of Education of the San Mateo Foster City School District, approving adjusted trustee area boundaries. Superintendent Ochoa. Thank you, President Proctor, with the decision. Um, that was just made by the board to adopt map scenario 1A. Um, at this point in time, we would recommend that the board approve uh, this resolution, uh, notating that uh, at the conclusion of this meeting, we would actually uh, go into the resolution itself and indicate um, in the resolution that map scenario 1A in fact was selected and specify the um, trustee area elections uh, up for um, uh, November 22 and those for November 2024. Um, so it is our recommendation that the board uh, approve resolution number 21 slash 21 dash 22 resolution of the Board of Education approving adjusted trustee area boundaries. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions from the board? Okay, Peter, can we go to public comment on this item? Absolutely. If there are any members of the public that would like to make comment on item 7-2, the resolution, uh, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. Okay, we have one. Randy, go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to um, thank Trustee Chin for his transparency in stating his rationale for his justification for his selections and ordering those. And I wish that the other trustees would have um, would have stated really their preference and not only their preference, but why that is their preference. Um, that would help for transparency for the public. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. President Proctor, there are no other hands for public comment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, coming back to the board for board comments. 
Uh, motion to approve. A second. Thank you, Trustee Chin for the motion and Trustee Watkins for the second. We will go to roll call vote, Trustee Warren. Yes. Trustee Watkins. Yes. Trustee Corzo. Yes. Trustee Chen. Yes. And I vote yes too. So that passes and we have a map and a resolution. Thank you very much. We will now go on to item 8.1, mid-year update on the 2021 to 22 local control accountability plan and district academic achievement review. All right, thank you, uh, President Proctor, um, fellow board members and uh, Superintendent Ochoa and community that's here with us this evening. Um, give me a second here and I am going to present my screen. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you tonight um, a mid-year update on our local control um, accountability plan, as well as uh, additional funding, which we have received um, over the last year or so. So let me go into presentation mode here. And if I could just get an affirmation as it loads there, can folks see that clearly? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, we are here this evening um, at the behest of the state of California. Um, there has been um, some specific legislation uh, that was passed this year that required, um, and we shared the original template with you back in the fall, uh, that we provide you with a, a mid-year review um, on or before uh, February 28th. And that that overview, uh, that that review um, uh, address the following elements. One uh, is the specific template that was put out by the state, the, the so-called supplement for the annual update. Uh, then also uh, a mid-year um, update on the implementation of our LCAP and our AD86 and ESSER actions, uh, the um, two date expenditures related to that. Um, a framing of, of how these uh, particularly additional funds impacted our overall budget as it's captured in the budget overview for parents. And then also uh, an accounting um, where available of um, our outcome data um, based on this work. So uh, that is uh, in effect the agenda for the next uh, 10 minutes or so to share this information with you. So let's speak first to the supplement for the annual update. And um, actually this section and the next section, um, you know, I would encourage uh, community to please pull up the um, linked PDFs that are in the agenda. There's a lot of content in uh, both these next two documents and I'm, I'm not gonna make an effort to, uh, to go through all of that. Um, primarily, you know, it's available for you to, to review. Um, as I am speaking, uh, but to the actual supplement for the annual update, there were uh, five prompts that we were expected to address um, in, this, uh, in this template. Um, the first was essentially, how have we been engaging with our educational partners? Of course, community, families, uh, teachers, classified staff, you know, site leaders, in the use of the funds that we received from the state through uh, the Budget Act of this year. Um, in our case, that's, that was specifically our Educator Effectiveness Block Grant, which we brought to you uh, back in December, um, as well as some programs that are, are coming uh, to share with you, which is our Expanded Learning Opportunities Program and our Universal Pre-K um, Planning and Implementation Grant. So uh, document is merely just ex explaining the ways in which we've engaged with our ed partners in that work. The second prompt actually doesn't apply to San Mateo Foster City. We don't uh, receive concentration funding. So uh, uh, that was uh, not applicable. 
The third is sort of the same as number as the first prompt, uh, but speaking specifically to how we've engaged ed partners in the use of the federal funds that were embedded um, in um, the state act. Uh, and this particularly harkens back, you may recall the learning continuity and attendance plan, which was uh, from last year, plus the AB 86 plan, which we brought to you last spring, as well as the ESSER 3 plans. And the, uh, the prompt there, and you'll see the description in the document of the ways in which uh, this is already publicly reported to you as a board and to the community that we engage with our ed partners. Uh, prompt four is a little bit of a, a, an odd one uh, at this time of year because we're, we're being asked to describe the ways in not in which that we planned to use uh, the ESSER 3 funding, but actually how we have already used the ESSER 3 funding. Um, specifically the federal portion. And just, just in the way, if you recall, we laid out in the ESSER 3, AB 86 and ESSER 3 plans, the idea that we were gonna take a three-year approach to the use of this funding, basically to align it with the LCAP. And uh, it, it so happens as we have done that and implemented, we have actually used first the state funds. And so it's, it's a bit of an odd uh, response in our case where we, we have to say, well, we haven't actually implemented those funds yet. And so uh, it leaves us in uh, not actually being able to, to say, uh, this is what we've done. So as, on the advice of our San Mateo County Office of Ed, we have just simply stated that in this template. And of course, you know, we'll, uh, as part of the LCAP and, and a follow up next year, we'll go into more detail about how we have uh, used that those various federal funds. And then finally, and, and again, this was a, a, thing, a theme that we hit consistently as we were approving the AB86 and, and ESSER funds. The question is, how are these funds being used in alignment with the LCAP? Um, and so our response there, you know, simply calls out that, yes, that was a major focus and expectation of our um, and partners and we uh, and ourselves as, as staff. And so, uh, you know, the ways in which our LCAP um, looks at questions of, um, you know, extending learning and ways in which to strengthen tier one and tier two instruction and provide uh, social emotional um, learning supports and professional development. All of these strategies that are embedded in the LCAP, well, we took advantage and aligned our use of, um, these additional funds to those and particularly to deepen uh, in response to uh, the challenges um, coming out of the pandemic. So the statement there simply describes the ways in which uh, these align. One way just to mention that it doesn't align is the LCAP, of course, is based on the assumption that students are, are in in-person learning. Um, and uh, we did use, um, you know, a, a significant chunk of these funds to support the expense related to offering a long-term independent studies program, uh, as well as the short-term independent studies we were doing in cases of students who are in person but needed to be out of school for an extended length of time. Uh, so that's the only way in which, you know, in effect, those funds were used not in alignment with our LCAP. All right, and then moving on to uh, the, the second document, which is um, linked in the agenda, uh, we're asked to talk about the ways in which we've implemented uh, the various uh, strategies um, embedded in the LCAP. And so um, one of the things that we have done, and obviously these are activities which are either completed because we hired somebody at the beginning of the year as directed by the LCAP or they are activities that are in progress. And in a few cases, maybe activities that are not started yet. Um, and so uh, again, this, this document is quite lengthy, but um, is simply organized around the, um, the LCAP itself. And um, if you've had the opportunity to go through it, it speaks to um, the um, six goals that we have in the LCAP. And uh, you will see uh, kind of, page by page. Uh, first of all, each goal section actually starts with LCAP metrics, which I'm going to come back to uh, toward at the end of tonight's report. 
Uh, but then for the actual actions and services, you can see the description of those actions and services. And actually on the far right, some summary statements about um, you know, whether an activity was finished or whether it was in progress or not yet started. And so again, there's a lot of detail here. I'm, I'm not gonna presume to go through um, all of it with you tonight, but just to say, um, you know, we now have publicly on the, on the record staff summary uh, of where we are in the implementation mid-year of, of our LCAP. Then the other requirement, I'm actually going to uh, invite my, my colleague, um, Patrick Gaffney, to, to jump on for a few slides uh, where we want to provide an update on the uh, expenditure of funds to date. And so, Patrick, if you want to jump in, and I'll I'll just sure. continue to drive the the slide great. deck here. Great. Yeah, if you want to go to the next slide, this is um, again this high level recap for you of uh, budget expenditures and actual uh, expenses. And as Dr. Chambliss was referring to a few moments ago, this breaks down those uh, expenditures by uh, goal area, so it's aligned with the slide uh, and these categories within our LCAP. Um, the goal area five students IEPs is outside expenses are outside of the LCAP. Um, so this is just a quick summary for you, aligned by goal area, uh, and those um, those reconcile to the overall expended amount. And again, we've not completed the whole year, so there's still some expenditures to incur uh, moving forward. You can go to the next slide, please, Dr. Chambliss. Again, this is for ABA 6 and ESSER expenditures. Um, this, again, shows you the budgeted amount and the actual expended amount. These amounts, again, by categories, um, align for extended learning, strength and math, et cetera. Um, those all reconcile to that overall expended amount. And again, we've not completed the full year, so there's still time for us to spend some more funds. You know, next slide. And again, this is just the overall uh, variance between the adopted uh, budget and then the final amount. This shows what we'll include in the budget overview for parents, the amount uh, as reference in the uh, budget overview for parents and then the final amount uh, in the budget act. And then it shows you uh, that portion of the overall LCFF, which is uh, the LCFF supplemental, which is what um, uh, is uh, earmarked for our district as part of the overall LCFF formula. So this shows you again, the growth in that calculation and um, we're embedding those in the overall LCAP and planning. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so I'm going to come back on now and spend a little bit of time talking about um, the mid-year information that we have on, um, on our LCAP metrics, uh, you know, in a sense, the, the outcomes. Um, I would refer you back again to that linked document, um, which is the, um, the mid-year update on the LCAP in each goal area, uh, area there is uh, the, the metrics are identified um, with the baseline and the expected 23-24 outcome and kind of in, uh, in the middle of that you will see where we have um, provided an update on the, uh, the whole range of metrics. I'm not again going this evening going to go through all of those metrics, but again, um, where uh, we have a metric, many of the metrics, you know, just given the LCAP are grounded in uh, the actual end of year uh, data. Um, and obviously we're here at mid-year. So uh, in many cases we said, well, the metrics um, set according to uh, end of year data, but we actually wanted to go ahead and provide you with the data as we have it um, mid-year. So uh, you'll see notes, notations about that. And in some cases, uh, there's a some uh, information or some metrics that are set around survey data, you know, where we haven't finished administering or have yet to administer uh, surveys. And so we weren't able to provide uh, some of that. So in some cases, you know, we don't know the outcome yet or the data uh, collection is in progress or actually we are able to provide that to you. So again, I would refer you back to that uh, mid-year update document, but I did wanna take advantage um, and at the board's request, uh, we wanted to have a mid-year um, sort of a benchmark update on our progress uh, so far. And so that's what I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes doing with you this evening. So uh, the first um, uh, mid-year benchmark data that I wanted to share with you is around our common formative math assessments. And the data that you see here is uh, reflects the percentage of students that achieved 
what we would describe as full understanding or meeting proficiency on the uh, on the unit assessments and you can see the comparison of uh, where we were at on uh, and again these are curriculum embedded assessments so we're looking how how well have kids uh, have, have our students come to understand the content that we've been uh, working on and you'll see the performance by tk2 and three five for the fall and the winter um, and just to say um, the desired outcome it would be at the end of the year according to the lcap we would want to see students at um, 80 percent proficiency and this is sort of that goal is guided by um, you know sort of standard uh, multi-tiered systems of support practice where you hope that all students um, on an assessment that approximately 80 percent are at least at um, full understanding. So you can see we uh, the results for, for those two grade levels. And then uh, we have the information for middle school. Um, and again, we've, you know, we've chosen to give you uh, kind of um, sixth and eighth as a way of, of simplifying the look um, of the fall window performance against the winter, winter window performance. Um, and um, would just like to acknowledge that um, we're, we're taking some very deliberate actions at sixth grade as a result of the implementation of our heterogeneous math six to, um, to coach and support and provide teachers collaboration time. And uh, we're actually seeing some, some very positive effects of that um, in that sixth grade performance. Um, we had an opportunity at, uh, at given some feedback to actually add um, a couple more slides here, which um, I don't know yet if it's posted in the version of this slide deck that's in your agenda. So the next two slides you may not have in front of you, but uh, there was a request to give us a closer look at um, sixth and eighth grade in terms of how different um, subgroups of students did. Now, again, these specific, uh, this specific look is not called out in our LCAP, but um, we're doing it in response to questions about how different groups. So you can see, again, this is that sixth grade performance, which was quite positive. We're seeing um, you know, pretty substantial gains between fall and winter. Um, obviously, we have um, some important work to do. We still have significant equity gaps in the overall comparison between uh, some of our groups, for example, English learner um, compared to non-English and whatnot. So there's still a lot to do there, but uh, we're definitely, um, in our view, moving in the right direction. And then at the eighth grade, the data um, by subgroup looked like this. You can take a look at that. All right, then uh, we're gonna turn now to um, the mid-year data that we have, um, our literacy assessments. And I recall that at, at the elementary school, we do the Fountas and Pinnell assessment. And you can see the fall window of um, students who are reading at or above grade level compared to the winter window. Um, let me emphasize to you that the, the expectation from fall to, wind, to winter is that students actually grow in the level of their performance. So to be clear, like if we looked at first grade, it's not that um, kids, we had kids, students at 48% um, say, and that at mid-year suddenly they're reading, like they're, they're not reading at the same level. Well, what's happening is they're not progressing at the same rate that we would hope. Uh, so um, there's some work you can see there, but some positives. Um, as well between the different grades. And then uh, we wanted to give you sort of a deeper dive, dive into, into two key grades at elementary school. So here's a look at third grade um, where we have um, a fall window compared to winter window and the desired outcomes as identified in the, um, to the right. I do want to acknowledge that in the LCAP, um, we did not uh, previously break out FMP performance by um, racial ethnic group. And so we actually didn't have a baseline for Latinx when we set the um, desired outcome of 30%. I think if you look at these 
at this third grade performance, and then you go to the fifth grade performance, where actually in the winter window, our Latinx students exceeded the outcome we had set for um, in the LCAP for the end of the year. Um, you know, so that just to say, um, we have to come back. And I think now that we've got a better sense of baseline, I think we're gonna have to do some adjustments in those expected um, outcomes. So uh, we'll come back to you uh, around that question. All right, and then um, just to say, just to share with you, so uh, we just are literally closing the, uh, at the middle school level, we use the reading inventory as our literacy assessment, and we just closed the window, uh, are closing the window on that, and so we're not yet able to provide that for you, but we wanted to give you a sense of uh, what was the um, percent of students at proficient or advanced um, on the RI in the fall. Um, by grade level. And then also, um, again, you know, continuing to pay attention to um, some, um, some profound equity gaps that we must address, you can see by uh, specific subgroups. And again, these subgroups are called out in the um, LCAP at, for those very, um, you know, those very equity reasons that we want to address. So we'll we'll provide you with an update on that RA data in a future meeting. And we'll pause there. Come out of this presentation and happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Thank you, David. Um, are there any clarifying questions from the board? I just have a couple. Um, just a question I had, and maybe you mentioned this and I was just a little too dense to understand it. Um, you know, the students with IEPs, um, Patrick, you mentioned um, that they were expensed outside of the LCAP. And I just wanted to understand that a little bit better. I mean, if they're included as part of our groups that we're tracking through the LCAP, I just don't understand why they're expensed outside of the LCAP. And Dr. Chambers, I welcome your input on this as well too. Uh, but when we look at overall special ed funding, um, the supplemental funds, which are part of the LCAP, um, we've got the, the whole set of special ed funds as a, a as kind of a, a different source of funds that are inclusive of AB six hundred two and other things. So, um, but Dr. Chambers, you may be able to speak directly to the comment uh, pertaining to embedded within the LCAP if they're explicit. Yeah, we wanted to make goals that are that are really that are really succinctly directed at just the special ed population as part of the overall population of yeah schools. and and this is just this is just the challenge with the design of any strategic plan. We wanted um, in last year's LCAP to have an equity focus to set a goal around our students with IEPs. Um, the actions that we, we captured within goal six, uh, excuse me, goal five itself um, are primarily um, actions that are part of our special education services. That's not that just saying that though, um, in goal two, in goal one, two, three, and four are actions where we're looking at the metrics for students with IEPs and they are, you know, the work we're doing to, um, support um, uh, strengthening tier one instruction, which of course has an important impact on our, our special education students, but is not exclusively for those special education students. So, um, so there's actually, there's, there's little outside of the special education services um, in the LCAP. There's, there's little funding outside of that within goal six, but there actually is a lot of funding in the other goal areas that specifically is targeting improvement of instruction and social emotional supports and things like that for students with IEPs. Okay, and can you define students with IEPs when you say that? Do you mean like any student with IEPs? Because I know I think we came into this issue last year when we were having a similar discussion in that, you know, when I think of a student with IEP, I, I don't think of necessarily whether they're in a gen ed or whether they're in, you know, a special day class you know, you can have an IEP in either location mm -hmm. for a student that has an IEP and they can be 
you know, whichever location is considered their least restrictive environment, because that's the law right. that says that we have to have them there. So I would be interested to hear like what your definition is and what the working definition is of a student with an IEP. Well, I think to speak to that, we, um, we think about the range of students who receive resource ser services, the range of students who um, receive instruction in special day classes, and then of course, uh, you know, speech, you know, speech pathology, all those uh, additional. So uh, we are being in the LCAP terms, we're being all inclusive and thinking about the work um, that has to happen to strengthen the instruction and social emotional supports for all of those students. So it's, okay. it's the well, broadest definition that, yeah, I okay. hope that answers your question. Well, that helps to understand that, you know, like we're talking the same language because yeah. I know in the yeah. past, you know, when I've had this discussion before with other um, members of the executive cabinet, you know, I, I'm thinking, you know, broad sense, anybody with an IEP is anybody with an IEP and they're meaning, you know, more exclusive and a more um, pigeonholed into an SDC. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure that we were yep. on the same yep. page with that. And then going forward with that, then, you know, you talk a lot about ZERN and students with IEPs, you know, that was you know, one of the things that you were mentioning with ZERN as well as with Fountas and Pinnell. Now that we have the definition that anybody with an IEP is considered a special education child, are students in SDCs getting ZERN? Um, and yes. are they getting Fountas and Pinnell um, yeah. assessments as well? Yes, so um, yes, and I would, I would say we've got some important work to do there. Uh, the question of the scope and sequence, and again, these assessments are rooted in an understanding of where we are in the scope and sequence for our, um, for our students in SDC classes is, uh, that's that's an air, an area of growth for us, and so um, again, we're still just to say we're we're still living some of the effects of the pandemic, right? Where we we launched curriculum, uh, and 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 did a significant amount of professional learning, but we still have some very important foundational um, professional learning to provide to you know Gen Ed and special education teachers. Um, and I know, you know, as part of the strategic plan moving forward, I think you'll start seeing ways in which we're going to uh, we're going to provide resources that will help us support teachers around, uh, especially in CERN, maintaining that, um, uh, you know, supporting that grade level with modification, grade level with accommodation instruction that um, we're looking for. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, when we're presented with the number of, you know, when we say, you know, special education students and the percentage of how well they're doing in Zern or in the Fountas and Pinnell that we're talking, all of our students in special education are getting, you know, like what's the number for Zern? Or is it just the students in Gen Ed getting that curriculum with that, you know, students with IEPs right. in Gen Ed that are getting that curriculum or yeah, you know, so it just it just makes a difference in terms of how meaningful the number is. Yeah, I understand, um, and I can we can follow up with you uh, in terms of you know the some of the data specifically. I would want to give uh, Cameron Lewis, our assessment person, a chance to sort of uh, give a fuller explanation to you. Yeah, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had a question for you, David, on some of the, the data where it shows like a red down arrow, um, you know, in uh, math for TK to second. And I think there was some reading at certain grade levels. Um, what are, so what, what now? Like, what are the strategies? How do we get back on track? And um, how, do we, how do we achieve our goals here? Yeah, um, well, I think there's, uh, uh, you know, I could talk a long time about this because this is, you know, where we live. But um, I think there's there's short term and long term um, responses to your question. Uh, in the short term, um, sharing with our principals this data, which has uh, happened over the last couple of weeks, um, we've m launched, uh, you know, a Math Boost Two, uh, which is attempting to um, provide uh, again a kind of short targeted, short term targeted intervention, um, uh, engaging with our teachers through that math boost process and through analysis of the, the data at the sites um, to um, 
to think about how are we re-engaging students in content. Um, one of the, the strengths of this assessment work is that this is actually formative assessment work that the teachers are uh, doing that's embedded in their curriculum. So they actually are, they're, they're really frankly ahead of us in many ways. They see this data very quickly for their classrooms because again, they're, they're the ones that are administering those assessments and then can immediately in our, our teams, um, you know, our, our uh, teacher leaders, our TOSAs and others are engaging them around what's the re-engagement strategy to accelerate student performance. Um, so those are some of the short-term things. And then I think long-term and mentioned, you know, um, the importance of, again, we've, we've got some really important foundational professional learning uh, to provide support to. Um, I also think we've got a, a model at the sixth grade um, of, of supporting, uh, you know, collaboration and coaching and immediate feedback around instruction um, that we're already talking about, particularly in the elementary, how can we think about that strategy being used at the elementary? Um, and then we've, you know, just to say we've talked around our literacy data, the importance of, um, of uh, you know, strengthening our foundational literacy practices and looking at some additional um, uh, supplementary resources to do that. Um, that's going to be a very important move from this year into next year. So again, short and long term strategies. Thank you. Are there any other clarifying questions? Um, I just want to follow up on um, President Proctor's question uh, regarding more specifically the TK to second grade um, I wouldn't say is the red arrow, essentially. Uh, one thing that I noticed was that the participation rate was only 75% or in the 70s versus uh, in the uh, fall quarter, I think it was 80 or 90%. I know that this data is sort of a snapshot on time. Is it, is, is it, is the lower participation rate in that data or the data collection partly due to maybe some of the classes haven't gone through it yet or haven't provided the data or because um, my initial thought is that part of the, the red arrow may be because it's the lower participation rate in the data. And I wasn't sure if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I would, I'd love to get Cameron to come back and uh, provide some additional analysis for you. But um, again, in person, the first year with Zern. So we're working on a scope and sequence. And, um, you know, I think we have, you know, we have teachers in classrooms and students at different at different places, so I think that's a factor. Um, I also remember that this, this assessment period occurred right in the heart of the Omicron um, challenge, and the degree to which that happened, that uh, particularly impacted our younger students, um, I would just add that that was a, a mitigating factor. Um, we had a lot of students out um, and that kind of thing, so, um, but let me, let me follow up with you on that question um, and, and, and give Cameron a chance to do some look at it. Now, th that would be very helpful. I know, um, and I'll just make one slight comment, even though we're not there yet in the comments, but yeah, if, if the dates of the assessment were obviously during the Omicron surge, I know that we, we had a lot of families and a lot of students out at the time, so I could understand that, but, um, but thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I just have a question. Um, thank you to everyone else that asked really good questions already. Um, I am just realizing that um, we are still, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find this in the presentation now and I can't find it. Um, <clears throat> we're still seeing some concerning um, data for our Pacific Islander students. Everybody else saw that, right? I just, I don't know why yeah, I can't I find it. It's on this one. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, I believe we are still seeing that. So um, would you, what, what are thoughts in terms of um, how we support those students? Yeah, I, um, you know, 
a bit of a kind of repeat of some of the things that I said before. I do think, you know, when we see this data, and again, the teachers have it right in front of them, and we re-engage immediately, uh, I think strengthening our ability to turn that around and, and respond quickly, again, through, you know, Math Boost is one example. Um, you know, uh, Superintendent Ochoa has also mentioned um, the work we're doing, you know, with our Footsteps to Brilliance and our um, ST Math, which again are really uh, reaching our families, including our Pacific Islander families, and and enlisting um, their um, support for their students working in these resources outside of the school day. Um, that that's really important. Um, so those are kind of again short term. I think long term, you know, I think the the um, the equity challenges that we have around. Uh, you know, just strengthening our ability to differentiate instruction, um, also to um, support students and families um, in their readiness to learn through our, our social emotional learning um, supports. I think those are all part of the, the um, formula for um, uh, targeting the, the, the improvement of our Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian students. Thank you. Okay, are we good on questions? Anyone else? Okay, let's go to public comment, Peter. Are there any members of the public that would like to make comment on this item? Please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. Okay, we have one, Randy. Go ahead, Randy. Hi, good evening again. Um, the question is for Dr. Chambliss. Congratulations on your doctorate. Um, I would like to um, find out if in um, going back to um, Cameron Lewis and then bringing forth these results, if this is something that the public has any visibility into or is this something that just gets distributed to uh, board members? I think this is something that is, um, is really interesting. And I think it's important for uh, the, the public to have visibility into these data. Um, the, the, the other thing is, is there any denominator for, the, um, for the, the winter period assessment or any sort of reporting about how many, actually how many students um, did not get assessed for any of those categories. I know that you mentioned that, um, that there was a lot of absence due to uh, the Omicron virus, but is there, you know, are, is there, are there any numbers instead of just percentages, are there any numbers to say for the fall assessment, how many did not get assessed for the winter assessment, how many did not get assessed? And um, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Okay, President Proctor, we have no other hands for public comment. Okay, um, we can begin our board discussion on this. Thanks so much for the presentation, um, David. And um, I, yeah, I mean, I um, appreciate kind of just the, uh, the commitment to the data analysis and showing us kind of growth and the subgroups, I was the one that asked for the additional subgroups for math, um, because, uh, you know, I think it's the, the increase in achievement in math in sixth grade is obviously notable. And we spent a lot of time talking about sixth grade. Um, and I, you know, one of the reasons that I was in support of that work um, was because of the districts and you know uh, district leadership and staff um, commitment to ensuring that it was really supporting all students, both students that have not um, historically done well and you know our our higher achieving learners. Um, and so, um, I yeah, I mean I think I don't I know we don't have that in our slides, so I can't actually like pull up that disaggregated data. But um, from what you shared, it seems like we're seeing gains across all of our subgroups in, in sixth grade math and. Um, 
pretty significant gains in some of, um, you know, with our English language learners, students with special needs, and, um, you know, kind of all of those, all of those groups. I, I think I'm accurate in saying that. Maybe actually, do you mind putting it up really quickly? Just, or I don't know if there's another way to like allow us to see it just so I can make sure that what I'm saying and talking about is accurate or me. Yeah. Um, Give me a minute. So yeah, I'll, I'm, I'll get it to you. Okay, perfect. Awesome. That's eighth. Yeah. Okay. And then let me get into the slideshow so the numbers are a little bigger. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> okay, so this is yeah. the sixth grade. Um, and then this is the eighth grade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm looking more at the, the sixth grade, I think. Um, not that eighth grade isn't important, it is, but I know that we've just spent a lot of time and energy and resources in sixth grade. And so seeing that already translate into improved student achievement, I think is notable. And I just want to, you know, recognize our educators and the team and everyone that's really work, working to ensure that that's happening. I mean, this is exactly why that shift was made and that this is exactly what we wanted to see as a result. And I know one of the things that we talked about is like, we want to be tracking that to see, is this, is this working? Um, and so I hope that this is something that we'll, we will be able to share with, you know, families as well. I would be interested to see, um, I don't know exactly how we would code this. I know that we still, even this year had some feedback from, um, you know, some of our students that potentially would have been in compacted math or students that are, you know, are in the gifted and talented program. I'm not sure if we could break that into a subgroup and I don't know exactly what would. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just thinking about like that population of, of students as well, kind of broken down into this. But anyways, um, there was one other thing I was going to share. Oh, I actually would really be interested in knowing how many students didn't get assessed for these as well. Um, appreciated that question and I think it is important. So if that's something that we can include um, moving forward in data updates, I think that that would be really helpful so that we have a sense. And um, if there's a, and, and I just think it's something, maybe this is already happening at the site level or um, you know district level, but if there's a pattern of particular students not getting assessed, of course, that would be something that we would want um, to be looking for. But yeah, I, I, I'd be interested in that as well. And um, just thank you for, for the update and giving us um, this information. It's really helpful and kind of exactly what I'm looking forward to seeing on a really continuous basis. So thank you. Um, I'll just share a few comments also. Um, thank you, David, for the presentation. Um, I really appreciate seeing this data um, here. It almost feels kind of real time. Um, and I'm I'm really pleased to see the um, the increase in um, sixth grade math. It's, you know, it just um, really shows how hard everyone is working. And I really appreciate that. I did want to say, I think um, Randy mentioned if we could update this for the public as well, I think that would be helpful. And then it started, I started thinking of something that's probably beyond what we can do, but it would be so lovely if that, if somebody was able to create um, our own school district dashboard, you know, where data is um, regularly updated and people can go to it. And it's just a place where people know where to find things. And um, this kind of a presentation is great, um, but you know, seeing it every quarter or however often um, the assessments are done would be really great. And um, people will just get used to seeing it analyzing it and, and knowing what everything means. So um, that was just my thoughts, but um, thank you for sharing all of this. I'll also just chime in and um, thank you guys for the presentation. Uh, I think it's great in terms of uh, the mid-year review and seeing where we're at at this point in time. Um, in regards to what um, I would definitely second sort of the data dashboard that Trustee Proctor had mentioned, and then also um, the topic what um, Trustee Watkins had mentioned about the sixth grade math. What would be really interesting is I, I know that um, there was a lot of effort that went into it. Uh, and I know um, speaking to uh, friends and families who um, have sixth graders, uh, cur current sixth graders going through the, um, the testing and the, um, 
in the process that we set up for. Um, I, I'd love to at some point, I don't know, Superintendent Choa, I probably would have saved this for my for my board member um, request for future agenda items, but some sort of update specifically once we get to a certain milestone about the sixth grade math, because this is great for the assessment, but we've done all a ton of work and it'd be sort of uh, update uh, when it's the appropriate time. So, um, but thank you guys for all of your work. Um, um, it's incredible. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank uh, thank you for the presentation as well. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to see that we are making gains with with our data and with our with our kids. And so, yeah, let's let's keep it moving. And thank you to all the staff and the families and the kiddos that are working really hard to make this happen. Yeah, it's nice to see um, data presented on the LCAP mid-year um, and see like positive numbers and green arrows going up. Um, it's really nice to see that. Um, and thank you to all of our educators out there making that happen because, you know, we, we can set the policy and, you know, we can, you know, okay, the LCAP, but unless we've got the boots on the ground actually doing the work, you know, those numbers aren't gonna happen. So you know, I think we really should show appreciation to everybody involved to making those numbers happen. And I know that we do that as frequently as we can. Um, you know, one thing that I do hope that we continue to have more, again, you know, coming back to the whole special education piece, um, you know, it's encouraging to see those numbers go up. I just know that, you know, in the past, we've been very kind of almost complacent with it and just saying, yay, we've made the state requirements or 1% above the state requirements, but the state requirements are really, really, really low for special education, um, you know, being proficient. What is it like 15% um, of the population can be perceived? And correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Chambliss, but I just remember it being like not even 20% um, proficiency and, you know, I, I, I feel like that is just so small. And I, and I know that our special education students, the vast majority of them can do better. And, you know, if they're sufficiently supported and scaffolded. Um, and so I just hope that, you know, we continue to look at that, and make that happen through the LCAP, you know, as, as, it, as, as we can. Um, you know, and also, I think, you know, when we talk about parent engagement, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of parents, I know myself included, you know, I, I have no idea what F and P level my child is. You know, I have no idea really and truly beyond like what I read with them at night, um, where they are in terms of like, you know, where, where, where they're categorized on this F and P. So as a parent, that kind of doesn't mean a whole lot to me. Um, so I just think that, you know, since part of our LCAP is parent engagement, if we can just find some way to help our parents understand a little bit more about what we're trying to, to go for, um, and what do like what F and P levels correlate with what grades or, you know, how can we help the, help our children, you know, increase to the next step, you know, if, if they're on pre-K or what is it, pre-A or something like that is like, preschool, you know, how are we going to get our kindergartners from pre-A to C, which is high, high kindergarten, first grade, you know, so I, I don't think there's a parent around that would, you know, willingly like, go, oh, okay, my kid can't read. I think all parents would want to come alongside and help. And I think the more involvement we get with parents, you know, that's only going to improve our LCAP scores as well. So I just hope to see that in the future. Superintendent Ochoa, do you have something you'd like to add? I do. Thank you, President Proctor. Um, I did want to respond actually to a comment you made, President Proctor, and, and let the board and public know that our um, ed services data staff led by our, our very, very talented coordinator of, of assessment, research, and accountability, Cameron Lewis, is actually working on a dashboard, um, what you just kind of described. We, we wanted to keep it... Um, 
under wraps, but you sort of ruined it for everybody, um, President Proctor. Hi. So um, we want to let the cat out of the bag a little bit. It's it's still under construction, and you know we will go through several beta uh, versions before we put it out to the public because we really want it to work very well when we get it out there. Um, but we felt that that was an important step to becoming a very data informed school district and a very transparent school district. So that is coming. And then the other thing that I would add uh, to the conversation is that um, when we think about student subgroups that are not achieving at high levels, um, uh, the data will show you our uh, African American student subgroup has uh, many, many uh, levels to grow. Our Latinx student subgroup has many, many levels to grow. Um, our uh, uh, Pacific Islander subgroup, our students with special needs. Part of an approach that we're taking as a school district is to connect with these families in a very genuine and one on one way. Um, and we've set a goal um, at the executive cabinet level of being able to meet with 100 families who uh, participate in these uh, subgroups over the next uh, four months prior to the uh, completion of this school year to hear directly from them what challenges they face and to understand um, on a very one-to-one -one level what we can do as a school district to better support their um, their goal of having a, a well-educated child. Um, and those meetings have begun. Um, we um, are very fortunate to have school principals that um, connect us with these families who um, sit with us and talk to us about their experiences. Um, and much more um, work has yet to be done um, in connecting with those families, but we've started the work and we're excited about it. And we believe it's really going to strengthen the strategic plan work that is um, about to go, uh, get underway here in the next few weeks, which is really the place where all of the comments the board is making this evening and, and the feedback that our executive cabinet members are making tonight is going to end up in that strategic planning process. Um, and uh, we're only weeks away from having a product for the school board to be able to look at and for the public to be able to review and comment upon. Um, and I look forward to that work. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the dashboard. I'm sorry that I ruined the surprise. I didn't know. Okay. Um, we are now moving on to item 9.1, audited financial statements fiscal year 2020 to 2021. Yes, good evening. Thank you, Madam President, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Choa. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight about the audit of financial statements. Um, we're pleased to bring them forward to you. I want to thank- sorry, Mr. Gaffney, um, you're on mute. Oh, so sorry. How am I? Is that better? Can you hear me now? Oh. No, we heard him. You can hear you him. Heard okay. you. Yeah. That's okay. There we go. All right. So uh, I first want to thank um, a lot of folks who put in a tremendous amount of effort to uh, generate this report for all of us and for our community. Um, thank the business team and also thank the members of Siobhan and Associates who um, put a lot of time and effort in working with our team to, to generate this information. Um, so uh, this is the type of report that as board members you'd like to receive. Um, ultimately, it's uh, the reports that were generated. They were unmodified uh, in terms of their uh, assessment uh, of the district. They went through a comprehensive review of all the district funds, uh, looked at fund balances, looked at activity, looked at compliance issues, looked at the district's management discussion and analysis, looked at internal controls. Um, and looked at prior year findings to see what progress had been made and what their current assessment is. So uh, again, for the financial statements for the federal awards and site awards, uh, the report that the auditors generated was an unmodified um, report. And um, in regards to internal controls, the comments from the auditors that there was no deficiencies in internal controls that were considered material. Um, so that's very positive as well too. Um, we had a finding from last year and uh, there's comments made in this report too of progress we've made to uh, address that. It wasn't considered material. 
It has to do, as you might recall, with the reconciliation between the capital assets that were reported in 1819 and then in 1920. And this um, variance um, is really associated with um, having multiple systems in place and transitions of systems from when uh, GASI 34 went into place in which he began to report assets and report depreciation on assets. So we've worked with and taken multiple steps that the auditors recommend we take already. Um, and at the time this report was generated, we had not completed the full reconciliation of that. There are some additional tasks we're gonna take and some additional reconciliation we'll perform. So for the audit for next year, it'll, it'll, be, um, it'll be a direct. Um, we have all the pieces of the puzzle to do the reconciliation. Some of the states back as far as back as information from 2011 and prior. So we're just, putting all those pieces of the puzzle together. And again, it's not considered a, a material um, deficiency, but it's something we're, we're uh, aware of and working on. So we're bringing forward the report tonight for your acceptance and recommending you accepting the audit report. Uh, Paul Fahm from Siobhan Associates uh, is also available. Uh, he's uh, with us tonight too, if there's questions the board have of him and his company. So I wanted to recommend approval of um, the audited financial statements to you tonight. Thank you very much. Are there any clarifying questions from the board? Okay, we can go to public comment, Peter. Absolutely, if there's any members of the public that would like to make public comment, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. President Proctor, we have no hands for public comment. Thank you. Are there any comments or discussion from the board on this item? Uh, I'll just make a brief comment. Um, um, thank you, Patrick, for your presentation. Uh, I just want to um, uh, thank you guys for um, all of your hard work. And uh, um, specifically, I just want to notice that the, the additional language that is on the agenda in terms of the paragraphs that are set up i actually think are, are way more informative too for not just us for, but for the public and, and you clearly state like the difference of the general the funds and everything else and i just think that that's that's a really good addition over the years so um i just want to note, let you know that i've noticed uh those changes and um thank you for for your work on those um for that Any other comments? Okay, I'll just um, thank you, Patrick, and to your whole team and to the auditors for all the work on these financial statements. Just personal note, I used to be an auditor and the, the size of the school district scares me. So um, good work, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you. So we can move on. Oh, do we need to vote on this? Yeah, you want to make it, yeah to accept it, please. Thank you. Okay, would anyone like to make a motion? This. Superintendent, oh, so are we supposed to vote on this? Okay. I motion to approve this um, presentation and this uh, and the uh, the audited financial statements. I'll second. Thank you, Trustee Corzo, for the motion, and Trustee Chin for the second. We'll go to roll call. Trustee Warren? Yes. Trustee Watkins? Yes. Trustee Corzo? Yes. Trustee Chin? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we have approved the audited financial statements. Thank you. Thank you. And we will move on to item 10.1, resolution of redu resolution for reduction of classified services for 2022-2023. Good evening, Board President um, Proctor, uh, members of the board, Superintendent Choa, and members of the public. Um, this is really my least favorite time of the year. However, um, this is you know business that we need to um, take care of to ensure that the district is gonna be fiscally solvent. Um, this evening, uh, um, in front of you is the resolution for reduction of classified services for the 2022-23 school year. 
Um, annually, we've brought this resolution forward. This year, um, I'm pleased because it's half the number of um, reductions that we had last year. We really made an effort this year to identify funding so that we did not need to have as many layoffs on this resolution. Um, the recommendation for the reduction of classified services is based upon the following factors. Um, one is the P uh, PTA funded positions. Um, at this time, um, the PTA um, has not made a, a decision and adopt its budget. And so until they can do that, um, we are we will need to lay off um, those positions. Um, we're really hoping, um, as in past years, that the PTA is going to be able to fund the majority of these positions, um, and so that we can go ahead and bring people back in their current um, assignment. Um, there are some positions that were one time um, that were funded with one time funds. Um, that's why they're on the list. And also, we are anticipating um, decreases in student enrollment. So that's the reason for the reductions that are recommended. Um, as Alicia Aragon had stated, um, you know, every year that I've been here, we've been able to offer work to people. So no one has um, needed to, you know, leave the district because there was a lack of work. Um, even if we're not able to offer work in their current assignment, we're able to offer work in other vacancies that we have in the district. And we're confident that we'll be able to do that this year as well. So. Um, I respectfully request that the Board of Tr Trustees approve the resolution to reduce classified services and the corresponding 28.75 FTE of classified employees in accordance with the procedures um, in the Ed Code. Um, this year, the law has changed for the timeline for classified layoffs, and so we are bound to the same timelines as certificate lay um, layoffs, which is March 15th. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Sue. Are there any clarifying questions from the board? I just had one question, Sue. Um, what is the anticipated decrease in student enrollment for the next school year? Um, Superintendent Ochoa may know better, but I believe it's another 300 students, approximately. Okay, thank you. Any questions right now? Okay, can we go to public comment on this item, Peter? Absolutely, if there's any members of the public that would like to make comment, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. Okay, President Proctor, we have no hands for public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, bringing it back to the board for comments or discussion or motion. I'll just say that uh, I know we all look forward to bringing back all of the, the um, teachers and staff on this list. And with that, I will motion to approve this item. I will second. Thank you, Trustee Corzo for the motion and Trustee Watkins for the second. Um, we will go to roll call. Um, Trustee Warren. Yes, Trustee Watkins. Trustee Corzo? Yes. Trustee Chin? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Okay. We have passed that resolution. We all will go on to 10.2 resolution for reduction of particular kinds of certificated services for 2022 2023. Similarly, we also have a resolution for certificated services. Um, again, um, the reason for the reductions are related to PTA funding, um, as well as um, decrease in student enrollment, um, and then some um, reductions um, due to district needs. Um, we are um, at, in the in the past um, we have had enough attrition through um, people taking leaves, um, people who are resigning and retiring. Um, so we did not need to send notices for certificate layoffs. And I believe it will be the same situation this year. Um, although I must say that we haven't had the number of resignations um, that we've had in past years. And hopefully that will remain the same. But 
um, due to the number of temporary teachers and the attrition that we've had so far, um, we are pretty confident that we are not going to need to send out any certificated layoff notices. However, we do need to pass this resolution. So I respectfully request that the board approve um, the resolution for particular kinds of certificate services for the 2022-23 school year. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Sue. Are there any clarifying questions? Okay. Um, Peter, can we go to public comment, please? Absolutely. If there's any members of the public that would like to make comment on this item, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. Okay, President Proctor, we have no hands. Are there any board comments or discussion or a motion? I'm at for a motion. Um, uh, thank you, Sue, for this. Um, this is just like that, like you said earlier, like the worst time of year. It's, we get caught in between basically process, right? We have to notify people of layoffs before uh, we get all the budgets from the PTA. Uh, it's basically to give adequate people enough notice. Um, but in the end, our district has historically sort of found positions for those um, um, people who um, who there may be classifications might have been eliminated, but we, we find them actual jobs. Um, it's, it's also the same time where you see in the media where everybody says, oh, they're cutting down, cutting 60 positions or this and that, you know. Um, but in the reality is, um, at least for our district, we, we do find people um, jobs. So um, it's, it's a weird process issue and I hate it. So um, it's it's like it's worse because people go through a roller coaster ride on this and seeing whether or not the job is going to be saved. Um, mm -hmm. In the end, we do try and save as many as we can. So um, so I'm with you, Sue. It, it's it's terrible. But um, but with that, I'll make the motion to approve this item. I will second this. this. Um, thank you, Trustee Chin, for the motion, and I made the second. So let's go to roll call vote. Trustee Warren. Yes. Trustee Watkins. Yes. Trustee Corzo. Yes. Trustee Chin. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So that resolution has passed, and now we will go to item 10.3, skipping and tie-breaking criteria. So although we likely won't be using this this year, but um, the education code does allow a school district to deviate from seniority um, if there are layoffs um, for specific hard to fill positions. Um, so presented to the board for information is the skipping and tie breaking criteria um, as we've done every year. Um, so I would be happy to answer any questions you have. I respectfully request that the board receive the skipping and tie-breaking criteria for information. Thank you, Sue. Are there any clarifying questions? Okay, Peter, can we check if there's any public comment? Absolutely. If there's any members of the public that would like to make comment on this item, please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. President Proctor, we have no hands. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any board comments or discussion on this? Okay, I'm seeing none, so we can move on. This next item is 10.4, Human Resources Update. Okay, it's me again. So um, thank you for this opportunity to um, provide an overview of staffing and the implications for work in the human resources department. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And can people tell me if they can see that? We can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, good evening. Um, 
Um, so this evening, I would like to just provide a brief overview of uh, the district staffing, um, some of the current challenges that we're facing, um, how we're addressing the challenges, um, a little update on CSCA and speed negotiations, and then the work that we have ahead of us as we transition out of the pandemic. So um, this is our district. We, this year we are 1,149 employees strong uh, with about 55% certificate employees, 40% classified and 5% management. Um, we are lucky to have some of the most resilient, knowledgeable and talented staff working to support our students. It's been a rough couple of years and they really have hung in there with us. And as I said earlier, uh, we don't have met much attrition this year, um, which we're happy for, um, but we also know that life happens and it can change as the year goes on. But um, we are, um, you know, fortunate to be almost fully staffed this year. We've had some vacancies um, due to, you know, health issues, mental health issues, you know, families moving, that type of thing. But for the most part, um, we've been able to really support students this year during these um, the during this time to give you a little bit of information on on attrition um, so for certificated staff for the past three years um, the rate has been around you know nine, nine to ten percent um, last year we did find that there was a rise about a five percent increase in attrition um, we really think that was um, impacted by the pandemic um, there were employees whose perhaps their partners lost their jobs, they had to move, they had to care for family members. Um, there were unique circumstances that came with the pandemic, but for the most part, our attrition has been around, you know, nine to 10%. On um, the management side, um, it's been, you know, eight to 10%. Um, again, you know, management employees as well suffer challenges. Um, I don't have the attrition rate for, um, for classified staff because it's just rolling hiring and it just, it varies um, with certificated and management. They are on um, year long contracts. And so we're better able to track that. Um, just some data on vacancies on the first day of school for the past three years. Um, in 1819, we had a 1.3% vacancy for certificated staff. Um, you know, 19, 20, 21, 20, um, 2021, we did pretty well. We were less than 1%. Um, last year, for 2021, 20, 22, this year, we did have a 1.3% vacancy. Um, we did have increased um, retirements, um, some resignations. Um, we did add new positions because we had some one time funding. Um, and you know we're fortunate to maintain sort of a 1.5-ish percent um, vacancy. On the management side, we had a slightly higher rate of vacancy. Um, that's because we have a smaller number of management employees. So if we have you know one or two vacant positions, it's um, the percentage is higher. But you can see that we were anywhere from you know two and a half to about um, five percent, depending on the year. Our current challenges, um, you know, increased number of vacancies and new positions. Um, like I said, um, you know, the pandemic has really impacted um, staff, um, especially in our hard to fill positions um, like special education. Um, there is just a fewer number of um, applicants out there and qualified candidates. Um, we've had more difficulty uh, filling positions due to the limited supply, but also um, there haven't been the in-person um, job fairs and opportunities to really recruit and meet. So we've done some virtual work, um, but it's it's been more difficult during the pandemic. Um, we are experiencing a large substitute shortage. So when we had the surge um, after winter break, I mean, everyone was out there. We had teachers on special assignment, we had administrators, I mean, our superintendent, you know, subbed at Abbott Middle School. And so we really did pull together as a district, but the substitute shortage is also acute along with, you know, a teacher shortage. Um, we also had increased absences during COVID. And so that also 
um, really impacted us. Um, lastly, you know, we continue to work on recruiting a more diverse workforce, um, but again, there's a limited supply. Um, you know, given all of the sort of immediate needs of COVID, um, it's been difficult to really stay focused on our longer term goals to diversify our workforce. Um, it's not a quick fix. There's no single solution, and we really need to attack this from various fronts. And so we're continuing to do that work. You know, we've tried different ways to address um, the challenges. Um, you know, one of the most important um, ways of doing this is really our collaboration with CSCA and SMEDA. Um, you know, we are negotiating, we're collaborating to improve working conditions. Um, we've been fortunate enough to be able to provide salary increases um, and attract people um, to our district. Um, we are also in partnership with San Mateo County Office of Education and Alder Graduate School of Education. We are pleased to be hosting four teacher residents um, who are special ed credentials at three of our schools. Um, we decided to partner with Alder because they're really focused on um, recruiting and attracting educators of color. And so we're excited. Um, our teacher residents will be meeting with them sort of, sort of for a final summary meeting. Um, but my understanding is that they're all doing really, really well. And we're excited to have them join our school district next year as, as first year teachers. We've also offered tuition assistance. Um, so our classified staff, our substitutes can earn um, a special educa uh, education credential through a local solutions grant. Um, that's been really helpful. Um, we have more diversity among our classified staff um, and having um, people who know the district, who live in the community, that know our students um, is just such a beneficial um, thing for the district um, as they become teachers and join our teaching course. Uh, we continue to have university partnerships with student teachers. Um, we made a decision a couple of years ago um, at, during the pandemic to have permanent substitute teachers and hire many more of them, trying to place one at every site or uh, multiple permanent substitute teachers at the middle schools. And that was very, very helpful when we we're going through the surge. Um, we've attended some virtual recruiting events, um, such as at Stanford. We're planning to attend the virtual um, job fair through the county office. Um, we've also had pop-up job fairs at the school sites. Um, Barbara Weatherly and the HR staff have been fantastic. They've gone out to different school sites before school and after school trying to recruit families um, or hand out flyers um, so that families can talk to other you know, friends and families. And, and that's um, gained us some, some new uh, employees. Um, just an, uh, a brief overview of negotiations. Um, as um, Catherine Pratt mentioned, uh, we met for the first time last week on February 15th. Um, we had a, a good first meeting. Um, some of the larger items that we are um, discussing um, is ob obviously compensation and benefits, um, class size. Um, we're looking at professional development. We hope to offer professional development extra days next year. Um, outside of the regular work calendar. Um, we also are implementing a middle school block schedule. And so we're negotiating the effects of that. Um, and we're also discussing um, TK and kindergarten and, um, and the school day. Um, our next meeting is next week on March 1st. And we look forward to meeting with our SMEDA partners um, and continuing our work. Um, with CSCA, we um, negotiated a successor agreement last year. So we have a three-year agreement in place but we are planning to um, meet for reopener negotiations um, later, a little bit later in the spring. And we just have one item open and that's salary and benefits. So the work ahead, um, you know, obviously uh, we wanna support the goals and the strategic plan um, and make sure that we have um, qualified people um, to support that work. Um, we'd like to continue our collaboration with CSC and SMEDA. Um, they have been such um, valuable partners, especially as we've gone through the pandemic. Um, having you know, this um, good working relationship has really allowed us to bring our students back. 
um, and you know, have all of us working together to make sure that we transition through the pandemic. Um, we'd like to improve our recruitment and hiring capacity. Um, we are really focused on wanting to find different ways. Um, we've met with Diego Perez, our wonderful new communications coordinator. Um, he's got a lot of knowledge and expertise around social media. So we did meet with him a couple of weeks ago um, to start having a more, um, pre more of a presence in social media. Um, we've posted some of the positions on LinkedIn. And so we'd like to continue um, developing that strategy. Um, we also will want to develop and implement strategies to retain our staff. We did pilot, you know, a, affinity group for educators of color this year. Um, although it was small, I think it was very successful. Um, I think people appreciated the opportunity to have the space um, to, to gather and have discussions. Um, we'd also like to invest in attracting and retaining a more diverse workforce, continue our partnerships with Alder to be able to offer tuition assistance. Um, and find different ways um, to find, to reach out to our educators of color or potential educators of color. And lastly, um, Superintendent Cho has really brought this district to focus on data. And so we'd like to track our recruitment and retention. So um, that just gives you sort of a brief overview of the work that's happening in, in human resources. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Sue. Are there any clarifying questions from the board? Thanks, Sue. I, I do have a couple questions. Um, I was wondering if we had um, data on our um, on staffing, particularly as it pertains to diversity, um, and um, in the same way that we kind of have the demographic data when we look at student achievement, like the demographic data for um, our educators and staff, because I know that diversity is um, a goal. Um, and so I'm just curious if we have the data in terms of where we are right now. Um, we, we, do have, we do have data. Um, some of the data um, when staffing was um, a, a goal as part of the equity task force, we did look at the data. Um, I can certainly bring that um, to the board or present it to the board. Um, what we found is obviously there is a big gap between the demographics of our teaching staff and our family, students and families. Um, we have a more diverse classified staff, um, but still a gap between our, our uh, the demographics um, between our students and families. But um, I'm happy to um, put that data together and, and um, send that forward to the board. That would be great. And I, I don't know if in that there, um, I guess once we have the data about where we are, if there are goals or if the team has goals in terms of what we're hoping to achieve, is it a match with student demographics? Kind of what are those goals? And um, so, yeah, maybe if that could be a part of it, if they currently exist, that'd be great. Thank you. We would love to have, you know, um, similar demographics, you know, we would love to have a workforce that's really reflective of our students in the community. We have a long ways to go, um, but we wanna get there and, you know, are trying to implement strategies to do so. Any other questions? I just have a general question. Um, actually, it's not super general, it's, it's kind of specific. <laughs> um, do we offer exit interviews to all of our employees that when when they leave and if so um are I'm, I'm assuming those are optional i think that's been my experience when leaving a job it's optional um, and if they are uh, conducted or or returned to the district um, what, do, what do we do with those so we have an exit survey. Um, it's an area that we really need to improve upon and work on. There is an exit survey. Not everyone fills it out. We don't have a great um, response. And so that's something that we need to work on to figure out how do we get, how do we get a good response? And you know, is it, are we asking the right questions? But we do um, review that every year. Um, and some of the questions include, you know, the reasons they're leaving, um, you know, what, what worked, what didn't work while they were working? Do they have any suggestions for us? 
Um, we do offer interviews and some people do contact me or the you know, director um, and, and we do meet with them whenever anyone asks for an exit interview, um, but it is optional. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Peter, can we go to public comment, please? Are there any members of the public that would like to make public comment? Please use the raise your hand functionality within Zoom now. Okay, we have one, Randy. Go ahead, Randy. Just a comment um, here that um, I heard uh, Superintendent Weiser say that she would make um, the diversity information available to the board. And again, I'm wondering if this is something that can also be made available to the public for transparency's sake. And you know, this is something that um, the, the public has buy-in to for this. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Okay. President Proctor, there are no other hands for public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any board comments or discussion on this? Uh, thank you, Sue, for your presentation. Um, the one comment or, or question, or maybe, I guess some more comment is that um, thank you for the attrition rate uh, data. Um, what, I, what I'm constantly thinking about right now and over the last, well, actually for a while now is, is measure B. And the, the goal of measure B, the number one was uh, retention and attraction for uh, staff, uh, teachers and staff. And um, I recall when I first joined the board that our numbers of hiring were a lot higher. Um, and I'm wondering if you could at some point maybe, or maybe it's a, it's a table that we see maybe annually or whatever, uh, in terms of the attrition rate, go back um, probably to 2015 or so, because I think um, what that shows is that if our attrition rate was, let's say 20%, uh, and then we went down to 10%, uh, that really shows what, um, what our parcel tax uh, did. And so I, I think that that would be really um, enlightening not just for the board, but for the public as well. So, um, but thank you for that presentation. Sure, I'd be happy to go back and, and look at that data. Um, yeah, we were really fortunate because, you know, statewide, um, the attrition rate was, you know, 25%. Um, so the fact that, you know, I mean, 15% isn't, you know, great, but um, mm -hmm. we're fortunate that we've been able to keep um, many of our staff. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Thanks for the presentation. Um, my only comment will kind of just be a follow up to my question. And, and um, I wonder if there's an opportunity to bring back um, kind of the diversity piece more ex explicitly, both with the data. And then also, um, I would be interested to kind of um, have an update on, I know, you know, the equity task force spent so much time digging into staffing and there was a lot of work. Um, so maybe there can be kind of an update on kind of where all that sits and both with kind of the data around where we are with our staffing, but then also um, just in general, how that work is progressing, which I know is sort of a request for future agenda, but also kind of fits within this. So <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think that that's an important conversation for us to have. And I do think, you know, to, to Randy's point um, that it makes sense for that to be available to the public for sure. Yeah, I'll just um, briefly add that, you know, I think we all recognize that we have more work to do in this area. And that it's also been a really difficult time for people in general. And, and um, you know, that's just gonna inherently make hiring more difficult. But um, overall, you know, we, I think we're all committed to, to the goals that we have and we'll get more clear on those, but um, you know, the, the work continues. 
So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, thank you, Sue. We can move on to item 11, board member statements and requests for future agenda items. Hi, um, I, I just have a couple comments. Um, uh, so I, again, just as alluded to earlier this evening, uh, we did have the opportunity to go to Lead and George Hall. Um, I also wanna extend my thanks to um, them for being so welcoming and for sharing and showing us um, all the wonderful classrooms and um, all the students and, um, and all the teachers educating our students. Um, I think it, it was it was great. That is again, I've mentioned this before. The best best part of our job, uh, being here on the board, is to actually go and see the classrooms. Um, I especially want to thank them because, um, from, you know, I can I can probably say I, I think for the most part the Omicron surge has has um, subsided, um, but for those people who don't know, I mean, it definitely hit our schools really hard, and and um, understanding that there were. You know, a third of some of our students out during like a two or three week period was was really tough for our um, our teachers and staff and our, our administrators. And I just really want to um, thank them again for all their hard work during during that surge. It was it was crazy. Um, the last thing I'll say is that um, I attended um, or the beginning part of my son's uh, first basketball game at the Borel gym. And I just thought it was amazing. And I just can't wait for um, Bowditch to get a gym. Um, that is uh, as similarly as nice as as Burrell and Bayside and um, and um, Abbott, and hoping that the Abbott gym floor is um, corrected sooner rather than later. So, but um, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. We can move on to item 12, future meeting dates. There's none listed. Superintendent Ochoa, do we have any other meetings to attend? I do, and I apologize for that. We have uh, for the public and for the board, um, March 3rd, a, a study session that we have pre-identified as a focus on early literacy. Uh, we'll, we'll go into a deep dive on student achievement data and March, uh, in fact, does have two regular school board meetings also matched up with the dates for February, which are the 10th and the 24th of March. Thank you. Okay. So, I don't know if I'm, am I allowed to ask a question right now <laughs> about future meeting dates? I know that um, we previously uh, that there's the possibility of having, I just want to make sure that it's clear for the public in terms of the March 3rd date, whether or not masking will be on that agenda or not. We did talk about that, Trustee Watkins, and thank you for bringing uh, that to our attention. We're, um, to a certain extent, we're waiting to find out what this press conference or information is going to come out from uh, Governor Newsom. He has publicly uh, raise that date, which is next Monday, as the possible date for some unveiling of a plan. Um, I tend to be just a little bit on the skeptical side and thinking it's also possible that it comes out on the 28th and it's not complete or fully baked. Um, on our calendar, we do have a, a two hour window for that study session. Um, and at the board's direction, we could absolutely pivot and add some time. Um, to talk mask, um, mask uh, guidance, mask changes. Um, but at the same time, we also have board community workshops that week um, and a survey that is about to be um, publicly reported um, to our community. So um, I would request to work with President Proctor on the specifics regarding that study session on March 3rd and say that definitively we will absolutely discuss it on uh, at the very latest on March 10th. Okay, thank you. Um, so the plan now is 
to adjourn this regular meeting and head back into class. Um, so if does anyone like you were cut off? Yeah, yeah, from I was just the, say, that, that we couldn't oh. hear. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Okay. So I was saying that the plan now was to um, adjourn the regular meeting and head back into closed session to continue our discussion on the items that were agendized. So um, would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn this meeting and move on? Motion to adjourn and return to closed session. Second. Thank you, Trustee Watkins, for the motion and Trustee Chin for the second. Uh, roll call vote will go to Trustee Warren. Yes. Trustee Watkins. Yes. Trustee Corzo. Yes. Trustee Chin. Yes. And I vote yes as well. Good night, everybody.